All right. Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Slater Rusa, and I'm the Education Coordinator at the Massive Music Center for the New Hampshire Audubon. Um, I'd like to start this evening with a land acknowledgement. So this presentation is streaming to you from our state headquarters in Concord, uh, New Hampshire, which is located on the site of the ancient village of Penacook in Indakina, uh, which is the tra traditional ancestral homeland and waterways of the Abenaki, Penacook and Wabanaki peoples, both past and present. I would like to acknowledge and honor with gratitude the land and waterways uh, and our ancestors, the Alnabak, or human beings who have stewarded the Indakina throughout generations for thousands of years. New Hampshire Audubon is honored to continue the stewardship of these lands, providing opportunities for all people to form connections to the natural world through our programs and wildlife sanctuaries around the state. I invite you to learn more about the indigenous presence on the land you occupy by visiting the website native-land.ca. Here you can explore and click on territories of indigenous people and get connected to the resources to learn more. For a more in-depth understanding of the Granite State, check out all the educational resources at indigenousnh.com. Um, this includes this interactive story map that details the indigenous presence uh, and their stories here in New Hampshire. So thank you for your interest in tonight's topic which is earth care slash people care, the power of natural spaces for personal and public health. This talk is our 27th and final session of a year long webinar called Exploring Connections and Stewardship of the Natural World um, and is supported by a New Hampshire Humanities Council grant. The past recordings of these talks can be found on New Hampshire Audubon's YouTube page, uh, which are also linked on the series webpage. Throughout the series, we are exploring the intersection between sciences and humanities, finding and forging new ways to connect with nature and learn about the importance of conservation action. I want to invite you to really take the time and space to consider how tonight's topic informs, strengthens, or otherwise supports how you define yourself as a person and how you use this topic to connect with human communities as well as the wild ones. I implore you to, to reflect on why this topic is important to you and your personal value system and how you can connect with others through this topic in your daily life. Uh, before I hand it over to Diane to introduce tonight's uh, presenter, Dr. Barbara McCain, I would like to uh, take this opportunity to briefly describe how this webinar fits into the larger mission of New Hampshire Audubon. Oops. And it seems my PowerPoint's not working with me now. There we go. Caught up. I, uh, oh, oh. Sorry about that. I think I just crashed a little. One moment, please. <clears throat> Okay, sorry about that. My PowerPoint seemed to crash on me and needed to reload. Okay, back at it. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, New Hampshire Audubon is a state-based environmental nonprofit organization that is completely independent from National Audubon. We rely on members and donors like you to support our charitable <laughs> mission, which has four programmatic pillars. 
The first is connecting people to nature through environmental education, like school uh, programs, nature day camps, and webinars like these. Researching and conserving species in peril, including large raptors and small birds. Managing about 10,000 acres of wildlife sanctuaries throughout the state for both habitat and recreation. And finally, advocating for sound environmental policy in the New Hampshire State Legislature. I am able to be here today because of donors and members like you. We also rely on a huge network of volunteers that assist us with wildlife monitoring, ambassador animal care, environmental mm -hmm. education, and wildlife sanctuary management throughout the state. If you are a volunteer, a member, or a supporter of New Hampshire Audubon, I would like to sincerely thank you. We simply could not achieve our charitable mission without you. If you would like to become a part of our conservation family today, please check out our website for ways to get involved. We have about 80 people registered for our uh, talk this evening, so you'll see that we are in full webinar mode. Please feel free to use the chat for any thoughts, comments, reactions uh, that you might have, and reserve the Q&A button for any questions that you would like answered. It's been great to see the uh, geographical reach that we've had uh, during these webinars. So for fun, you can try typing into the chat uh, where you're watching this presentation from. <clears throat> um, I want to just give a quick shout out here to uh, Diane DeLuca, who is our senior biologist uh, responsible for orchestrating the series. Without her leadership and coordination, this webinar series would not happen. So thank you, Diane. Diane and I will be monitoring both the Q&A here in Zoom, as well as on Facebook Live throughout the evening. I've set parameters on the Q&A so that other attendees can see the questions that will be asked and can comment or upvote the questions that they want to see answered. In the event that we have more questions than we have time to answer, this process will help us hone in on what questions we should focus on. Uh, that said, don't be shy about asking questions. Um, it's the best way to learn something new. So from here, I'd like to just hand it over to Diane and she will introduce this evening's presenter. Slater, and I'd just like to give a shout out to Slater for filling in for the last few presentations. We definitely couldn't do it without him. So tonight we are very appreciative to have Dr. Barbara McCann as our speaker as we come to the conclusion of our Exploring Connections webinar series. Her presentation, Earth Care, People Care, the power of natural spaces for personal and public health seems like a perfect way to bring together the many programs we have been fortunate enough to learn from in the last year. So Barbara is a professor at Plymouth State University and serves as the program coordinator for the public health degree program. She received a bachelor's, master's, and PhD in biological sciences from the University of California at San Diego and Santa Barbara followed by postdoctoral training in immunopathology at the National Jewish Hospital in Denver, Colorado, and a research teaching position at the University of Hawaii. She made a life pivot in 1983 and joined the health fitness industry as a certified health fitness instructor. She also received advanced training as a physical activity and public health practitioner, and she has taught a wide variety of courses over 30 plus years at Plymouth State University in nutrition, physical activity and health, exercise science and public health. She serves on a number of local agency boards and is a member of the PEMI Climate Crisis Coalition. She is a permaculture practitioner, avid walker, open water swimming and forest bather. So thank you so much for sharing your expertise with, with us tonight. Really excited to have you. It's my turn. Okay, well, thank you everyone for coming tonight and for following this wonderful program for the last year. It's, it's really been an exciting um, opportunity to be able to hear from so many different people and, and gain such, some tremendous information. So I feel really honored to be kind of the wrap-up capstone presenter, um, but also it's a little bit daunting to think about that. So this topic I chose um, at least a year ago now, and 
as is usual or typical for me, I take a topic that interests me. And then when I really start digging in, I find out a lot about what I don't know. And that was, that was somewhat true in this case as well. Um, and I hope I've, I've pulled together some information that you will find interesting and engaging and informative. So to get started, I am gonna share my screen. I have a little PowerPoint presentation prepared. Let me just double check on something there. One more time. Okay, gotta make sure all the buttons are clicked. Cool. I've actually added a little something to the title of this talk. And, and some of you may, um, you may recognize the triad of concepts of earth care, people care, and fair share, which we'll get to later on in the talk. And I decided to call it the importance of natural spaces for personal and public health rather than the power, although I do very much believe that there is power in natural spaces. But in preparing for the talk, um, I was really astonished by the amount of research and information that is in the scientific literature on this very topic. So the overview of what I hope to cover tonight is, let me get this out of the way, is that number one, humans need and flourish with time in nature. The idea of being in nature has many different manifestations, but the idea of spending time in the world where things are not impacted greatly by humans that are growing, are simply being, and are out from underneath shelter, I think is kind of a general way of thinking about time in nature. The second point is we need multiple ways for nature connections to happen and be fostered. There are so many different ways to be in nature. I grew up in Southern California in the pretty large city of Torrance, and I was very fortunate to be able to live on a street that actually had trees. And my father was a real lover of fruit trees and our whole yard was full of various kinds of food producing plants. We had peaches and plums and pears and figs and guavas. And so it was sort of normal for me when I grew up to just spend a lot of time outdoors, but I didn't realize until later in life that that was really a bit unusual. And unfortunately, it has become more unusual in contemporary life. But the third point, access to nature is a birthright that is currently not available to everyone. So we have big discrepancies and inequities in the opportunities for people to experience nature across our country. And it's time for action in all forms, public, private, community, and individuals to meet our climate crisis. The climate crisis is now and will continue to impact nature in a whole variety of ways. And I know nature will survive, but things will be different in the not too distant future, unless we take very seriously some of our impacts on the natural environment. So when I started to just think about the situation, I came up with a few ideas that all living beings depend on the nature for survival in some basic way, shape, or form. The security of our food, food sources, water, and raw materials for climate stability. In other words, just the thermal balance that we need to exist. We have a very small range of thermal tolerance in the human body. And then we also have our psycho, psychological, spiritual, and social wellness that is impacted by our physical surroundings and nature. And the importance of connections with nature are robustly supported in research. As I mentioned, that was one of the biggest surprises when I really started to dig into the topic is the abundance of medical literature, public health studies, environmental and eco-psychology studies, some of you may be familiar with the National Geographic research that produced the Blue Zones books, urban planning, landscape architecture, and even education. 
And so there is a lot of information on this topic. And what consistently comes back is the idea that global warming is a true threat to the delicate balance in nature that we enjoy. My photograph here is from um, one of the tracks in on the South Island of New Zealand where I was able to spend a bit of time on my sabbatical in 2019. And this was my little friend, the robin that came to greet me on the trail that morning. I know birders will be interested in that. So quality nature experiences support good health. That's just become so highly proven and, and very, very supported by research science. Mental and spiritual health, where there is um, evidence of a reduction in depression, reduced anxiety, and an increased sense of connection am among people that spend even small amounts of time out of doors or in a natural environment. There's a general physical health impacts, um, and I'll show you some examples of some robust studies that have shown reduced chronic disease risk, increased quality of life, and surprisingly, um, an impact of control of post-traumatic stress syndrome among people who suffer from that. Again, by um, eco-psychology techniques. And in early development, if you were here for Dr. Hannon's talk last week on the Mountain Village Charter School, they're basing the entire educational process on the importance for, of outdoor experiences for cognitive, social, and emotional development in children, and a, to develop a sense of earth care and connection. So of, overall, the results are of all the different types of research that exposure to the outdoors, green and natural spaces, supports well-being and longevity. And there's nothing, nothing more important than living a long time, but living well. So some examples of this research. This is one, for example, that comes out of a journal called Eco-Psychology. Who knew there was a journal of eco-psychology? But there is. This was a 2018 publication entitled Green Space Ecotherapy Interventions, the Stress Reduction Potential of Green Microbreaks, Integrating Nature Connection and Mind-Body Skills. So this was a study that investigated the efficacy and the psychological impact of two short one and five minute green space interventions on a college campus that integrated two proven approaches to stress reduction, mind-body skills and nature exposure. So they actually created a program called the RESET program, which stands for Release Everyday Stress and Enjoy Trails. When I read this article, I said, I want this program at Plymouth State University. Intervention was well received by the students and had a positive psychological effect on 96% of the participants as compared to the controls. The most important impact was relief from stress that was reported by 82% of the participants. And they had a very large study group. It was, um, I can't remember exactly. I think it was in the four to five hundreds. It was a pretty good sized campus. So the guidelines for this intervention, if you're interested, were provided by the Wild Rock Nature Play and Discovery Center, which is located on the land of the, the Manikan and Manahoac people in Crozet, Virginia. So I know that um, if you're interested in programs for young people, this is a good resource. Another example of some research um, was from the Journal of Counseling and Development back in 2012. The title of this research was Eco Wellness, the Missing Factor in Holistic Wellness Models. If you um, are familiar with wellness models, many of them are as simple as mind, body, spirit. Some of them have five dimensions or six dimensions. Others have as many as eight dimensions. And this was a discussion of the importance of including the concept of eco-wellness as one of the dimensions of overall holistic health. So in this research, a growing body of multidisciplinary literature 
has shown or delineated the benefits that natural environments have on physical and mental health. Current wellness models in counseling do not specifically address the impact of nature on wellness or how the natural world can be integrated into counseling. Now remember this is a 2012 um, article and much has changed since 2012. The concept of eco wellness is presented in this paper as the missing link in wellness models and counseling. Integrating eco wellness into counseling provides new and potentially powerful interventions to enhance wellness across the lifespan. So in 2012, this was an idea that was emerging. And now in 2018, in the last paper I showed you, we have entire programs on college campuses that are addressing and creating interventions for exactly this purpose of integrating eco wellness into the programming. So the, the next research that I found was from um, the Indian Journal of Health and Wellbeing. So this understanding of the importance of nature connection is not just happening in the United States, it's global and it's hugely global. So when I found this article, I was quite intrigued. Human nature connection and mental health. What do we know so far? And again, I'm, I'm, I will let you do the reading of the entire article if you're interested, but this article really was um, delineating, deline excuse me, delineated the effects of nature exposure on health and conceptualized the nature-based therapies and techniques that are in the research literature. So this was a, a research review paper and gave lots of information about um, the disconnect with nature among today's children and how to support and rebuild that connection through outdoor education and the importance of turning to indigenous ways of teaching for a better impact. So I really appreciate the um, acknowledgement of the indigenous lands that's, that is always presented before these, these webinars, because we're learning much more about the importance of these, these practices and understanding the history of these practices in helping to build nature connection in young people especially. And then finally, we actually have a journal called Sustainability. And this is um, an article I discovered, which is entitled Showcasing Relationships Between Neighborhood Design and Well-Being. And this is happening in the city of Toronto, where um, they have done an amazing piece of landscape architecture research, looking at 140 neighborhoods and the landscapes in those neighborhoods in Toronto. And the goal of this study was to calculate landscape ecology metrics. And this came out of um, 2007 data from the city of Toronto, and it was used in sustainable development planning strategies and to bolster a program called Wellness Toronto. So this research is happening at not just the individual level of psychotherapy or counseling or medical intervention, it's happening at an even larger scale, community scale, um, cities and town scale. And so I think it's helpful to, to understand that this kind of work is actually being done. So you can see by the legend that they mapped out the tree canopy, grasses and shrubs, bare earth, water, buildings, roads, and other paved surfaces, really getting a handle on the nature of the city and how its um, natural environment exists. And then this literature review really blew me away. This, I call it the mega literature review because it's from the International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health. And this was a scoping review of nature, land, and environmental connectedness and relatedness. And they studied, I think, 123 different research articles, categorized, analyzed, and tried to synthesize the major concepts out of all of this research. And this was about land, nature, and environmental connectedness. 
as the topic that needs to be addressed and further explored in relation to improving the health and well being of communities at large. So, this research is really looking at community health in addition to individual level health. The study demonstrated the diverse measures of nature and land connectedness, with the findings emphasizing the importance of maintaining relationships with nature and land. So the takeaway from all of this for me was that this is a huge field of study and people are paying attention and looking closely and gathering together a wealth of evidence for the importance of taking care of our natural spaces. People who have access to nature learn to care about it. And so as we, um, as we think about the activities in which we are engaged personally and professionally, I think this is, for example, the work of the Mountain Village Charter School is to develop in the children that are in that school through their access to nature, a deep and abiding concern and care for nature. It's a cultural shift that needs to happen. So it's kind of like, we've got to get people in nature so that they will understand and enjoy and respect nature in ways that really impact their behavior and their choices. We're all at a time in human history when we need all hands on deck to participate in climate change mitigation. Um, this talk is not about climate change mitigation, but suffice it to say, the earth needs active public health advocacy and we need to promote nature connections as in as many different ways as we can think of to build in our population, both local and national and global, an understanding of the need to protect our natural environment as much as we possibly can. So there's also a science going on um, on city living. And I've pondered a lot about what's happening to rural places. And I put rural in quotes here, especially New Hampshire. I live in Plymouth, New Hampshire, which is right in the center of New Hampshire. And recently we have been experiencing people flocking from the cities, primarily Boston, but other areas as well, in reaction to COVID-19, they are seeking to be, quote unquote, in the country. And I actually got that from personal interviews and talking to people who have migrated to our area, moved to our area, purchased homes in our area. Um, and they wanna be in the country. They understand the importance of being in nature. However, they also expect city attributes. So I feel like, and I've actually done some reading about the phenomenon of micro urban areas. And in some ways, the town of Plymouth is becoming a micro urban type of town because we have access to food resources, grocery stores. We have access to healthcare. We have community services. We have schools, we have a university. Some of the things we are lacking are um, general transportation system, public transportation systems. Um, and we, we lack actually the adequate infrastructure to support the growth of the population that we're seeing. Um, so what we do see happening is that we're still in the process of building infrastructure for low energy transportation. We are seeing structures being built, um, which are taking up an awful lot of our green space. We've lost huge swaths of green space in the last 10 years to infrastructure to support this growing population. So we're losing green space, we're losing biodiversity, and there's a lot of pressure on our water and sewer treatment systems, for example. A lot of pressure on our um, watershed areas into the lakes, because we're sitting right in the middle of the lakes region of New Hampshire. So we really need planning, for both climate change and increased population density. And interestingly enough, climate change has been declared as the number one public health priority by the American Public Health Association. And if you're interested more about that, a lot of the um, links I put in this PowerPoint will take you to that resource if you want to actually see it. I'm gonna catch my breath for a moment and see if there are any questions.
before I jump into the next slide. Anybody monitoring our chat or our Q&A? There are no open questions right now. Okay. Barbara. Awesome. So this is um, an excerpt from a recent article, August 24th, 2020, that was published in the New York Times. It is entitled, How Decades of Racist Housing Policy Left Neighborhoods Sweltering. And this diagram is discussing the issue of the inequities that exist locally, globally, and well, locally, nationally, and globally in people's access to green spaces or natural spaces. It is an urban issue for sure. Although even right here in the small town of Plymouth, I would say that there are large percentages of people in our population who are not able to access outdoor spaces anywhere near as easily as other people. Um, lack of roads, lack of easily accessible trails, lack of easily accessible parks, places to go that are safe for children and people with families. Um, we are a rural environment and it seems like it's easy to get outdoors and go for a hike, but getting to where the hiking is and knowing how to manage the hiking is a, a skill set that um, actually a very small percentage of our population have. And that's also reflected in this, in this idea of the fact that access to nature is not equitable in many places. The result is a strong correlation of nature deficit with poor health. So on the one hand, we know that being in nature is health promoting. It's also very, very evident that nature defi deficit is correlated to poor health and increased risks of the chronic diseases that are the major health problems in the United States today. And changes are needed in urban and suburban planning and green infrastructure. It requires collaboration to build resilience and sustainability. And many countries are working to address the need for more green for everyone. I'm just gonna pop to this link, this reference link for the New York Times. Let's see if I can do this. I think I can. Control click. No, it's not working for me. Oh, maybe that'll do it. I'm not gonna subscribe right now. Oh no, is that really doing that to me? It is. Oh. Well, we're not gonna go there. You guys can look this up if you want it. How do I get back now? I have a subscription to the New York Times, but it's not gonna let me see the article unless I subscribe. So we'll move on. So this is a photograph of a, um, an urban playground for a child. And when there is an absence of canopy, when there's an absence of green spaces and parks and playgrounds, there are higher risk for serious health consequences correlated to the absence of that canopy and vegetation. And if you're again interested in more information, there are multiple benefits of urban tree canopy. This is another link that I have found. And what was interesting about this link, it actually comes from the National Library of Medicine at the NIH. And it's again, it's another piece of research on the multiple health benefits of urban tree canopy, the mounting evidence for green prescription. I'm even concerned for example, in downtown Plymouth, we've had a gradual loss of the trees on Main Street. And some of this has been from in some cases, the age of the trees. And the university has been very mindful to plant trees in preparation for the aging of the older trees. But it's also just been a general kind of behavior for some reason of 
the Main Street merchants, people on Main Street, trees have just been coming down and not being replaced. So we are losing our downtown canopy. And I think it's a um, something to look at in your own town settings as to what's happening with canopy, because this is gonna be really important for sequestering carbon, helping to mitigate um, the warming of our climate, as well as producing shade to help cool and keep environments well sheltered from UV radiation. So similar articles I thought were really interesting that there's an inverse relationship between urban green spaces and childhood autism in California elementary school districts. Residential urban tree canopy is, is associated with decreased mortality during tuberculosis treatment. It just goes on and on story after story about the importance of canopy in cities and towns. So some of the things that are going on around the world are really fascinating in terms of how people are responding to um, the climate crisis and to the need for re-greening. Growing biodiverse urban features, re-naturalization and rewilding as strategies to strengthen urban resilience. So how our cities are using nature-based solutions to confront the challenges. I don't know if any of you, well, some of you have probably been to some cities lately, but um, for example, Portland, Oregon has promoted a program of gardens on rooftops. And in New York City, I know a lot of the buildings are starting to put gardens on rooftops, but whatever the structures are and how they manifest, it's becoming more and more important for us to try to bring back green spaces in places where they have been eradicated and lost. So what can we do to help is the question. And this is a, this is a photograph from Columbus, Ohio on a, a neighborhood street in the older part of town which still has canopy. And I visited um, Columbus to see my daughter who's finishing up her master's of, of landscape architecture there and this was one of the streets that is um, a prized street because of its canopy. It's about 20 degrees cooler in the summer, which is very hot in Columbus, than most of the other locations in the city, which have been pretty much uh, stripped of most of their canopy cover and um, greenness, greenways in the city. Although Columbus has done a pretty good job of establishing and maintaining and, and providing access to a number of community parks with, where people can simply go and ride their bikes, go for walks, play on the grass, under the trees, walk in the woods. Um, there's some really nice community parks in Columbus. So it's got diverse uh, situations of very low green areas and then some pretty good city parks. So what can we do to help? Well, in public health, we use a model called the social ecological model for problem solving. And it helps us to see issues from wider perspectives. And we use it to tackle challenges in a systematic way. So when we talk about regreening of cities and towns and, and planning and creating policies, these are all these outer layers of the shell of the shell in public health, which are really, really important. They're critical, they make a huge difference they impact large numbers of people. We can have some involvement in these. Uh, volunteering to be on your local planning board or making sure in, you're in touch with the, the city planners and the policymakers about what's going on in your town or your state. Um, making sure we understand what's going on nationally with our legislators and with our policymakers. But there's also the interpersonal and the individual levels of action that we can think about taking some steps there as well. So what's going on right now in culture policy and at the organizational level in terms of working for um, solutions to the climate, climate crisis and increasing our 
um, green spaces. So at the federal government level, the agency's laws and policies, we've got the Environmental Protection Agency, Health and Human Service, USDA, Department of the State, Interior, Defense and Energy, the CDC, and we now have an Office of Global Change, which I didn't realize. We also have state government agencies, the Environmental Services, Health and Human Service, Safety, Department of Transportation, our State Parks Agency, Agriculture, Fish and Game. So in the state of New Hampshire, we have a number of agencies and departments who have on their agendas to help re-green our communities and maintain our green spaces. Then we have non-government agencies, the Audubon Society and the Nature Conservancy. Thank you very much. Uh, also both very active organizations in working towards conservation of lands. And I found a really interesting resource called the Climate Store. And the Climate Store has a list of many, many agencies that are working on this very issue of um, maintaining green space. If you wanna to go to that list of agencies, you'll see just how many there are. Let's see if this will work today. Here it is, the Climate Store the 50 nonprofit organizations working to stop climate change. The list is robust and is categorized into climate change action, climate change education, and wildlife and ecosystem conservation. And here we see Audubon on the top of the list, Conservation International, Conservation Land Foundation, Land Trust, Nature Conservancy. So many of you, Sierra Club, the Wilderness Society, you may belong to these organizations, support these organizations, or maybe think about belonging or supporting any of these organizations. They can use our help. And then when we start to think about, um, oh, this was the regreening efforts of the um, Nature Conservancy. They actually are very specific about funding trees for health. They have an entire program which is dedicated to just that. And they have done the return on investment research. In um, one study in California, for instance, found that for every $1 spent on tree planting and maintenance, urban trees deliver $5.82 in benefits. So if people think that planting trees is too expensive, they're really probably not taking the full picture in mind. So they can see that this is the diagram that came out of this report from the um, Conservancy about regreening that our urban canopy supports clean air, cools the air, promotes exercise, improves mental health, reduces asthma, cardiovascular disease, has a lot of health impacts or health outcomes, which are important to our health stakeholders. And the financial resources then can be generated, which help the urban forestry stakeholders to keep the urban canopy. So it's a, a circular relationship linking the finance streams. And we need to acknowledge that this is something that can be accomplished if we get the right stakeholders at the table. I also discovered that there are national park cities. This is an effort, an international effort around the world to increase green spaces in cities. And the two cities that are um, bona fide national park cities with others in the wings getting ready to, to receive that um, identification are London and Adelaide. And this is a map of Adelaide. And you can see that um, this is actually a, you know, like a Google map. There is green infrastructure in and amongst the less green uh, gray of the city. And they have been very intentional about incorporating green space into the city. They recognize the relationship between people and nature, wildlife and habitats, clean air, healthy rivers and waterways, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they are taking this very, very seriously. And I want to take you to, let's see if this will get me there. Okay, little, a little two minute video so you can learn about what's going on with National Park City.
Barbara, I'm not sure if you're seeing it on your end, but we're not seeing it. You're not yeah. seeing it? Oh, no. No. Uh-oh. That's not good. You might have to stop sharing your screen and then reshare in the video's window. Uh oh, I just started it twice. <laughs> Greening of our city, a bold, uh, climate resilient vision for greening metropolitan Adelaide. A hundred kilometers of metropolitan coastline. In okay. I gotta stop this. <laughs> You can hear him. Um, trying to figure out how to get out of here. I can't figure out how to stop this. <laughs> If you try screen sharing again, maybe just share your, your whole window and it hopefully will be on the top. Um, I've got to stop YouTube though, somehow. Otherwise the next one might play. No. Well, have a look at National City Parks. It's, it's an amazing project that is, um, global cities are competing each, with each other for this designation. Um, I think we're gonna see more about that in the future. And I hope some of the cities in the United States will begin to take this on as a, a real issue and activity. Are we screen sharing now? Are you seeing cities connecting children to nature? Yes, that's what Good. we're seeing now. Yeah. Another program to look out for that I think is really coming fast and furious down the pike. You can see all of these cities that have been designated by this program, Cities Connecting Children to Nature, um, which is offering technical assistance for developing nature connection strategies as a part of their city planning process. So I think we'll see a lot more of that coming down the pike too. Another break time, shifting gears here. Any questions or comments in any of the communication streams? Robert, someone asked if you're um, if you're an ANFT forest therapy guide. If I am personally, and I'm not sure what ANFT stands for. So I am not. I am not. That. I'm not an authorized forest guide. I'm an amateur who does it with people for fun, but I am not a, any kind of registered guide. But I'm interested in knowing about the organization that registers people to do that. Can that question turn into information for us? That would be great. Yeah. Dennis is asking, because he said you were a forest bather. So maybe people are curious as to- They're curious about forest bathing. Well, right. forest bathing is not actually taking your clothes off and getting in the dirt or anything. Forest bathing is a process by which people find a quiet, and safe location. First of all, you know, safety is kind of important and it's important in terms of insects and sun and wind and any kind of sensitivities people might have to the, the plants that are growing. I mean, I'm very sensitive to poison ivy, so I have to kind of watch out. Um, and so it, it, it's, you can wear clothes when you forest bathe, but it's being open to and going through um, a systematic process of checking in with all senses. So you're experiencing the forest through smells, through sounds, through sights, even taste and touch. So much like um, any form of meditation, forest bathing can be accomplished through walking meditation, sitting meditation, lying meditation in and around the forest. And it's simply a matter of being in the forest, fully mindful of everything going on around you. Usually it can involve walking, hiking, can be slow, could be in the company of others or not, but
but it's very mindfully going through and checking in with all five senses of what you're experiencing while you're in the forest. And the forest can be, that's a metaphor in some ways for different types of outdoor places. I mean, you could do this on a beach, on a saltwater beach, on a freshwater beach. You could do this in the desert. You could do this on a mountaintop. You can do it in a valley. Um, so nature takes many forms. And the, the idea of forest bathing is to just really focus on the sensory experience. Does that answer the question? No. Thanks, Barbara. So there were a couple of comments in the chat. So Karen shares that ANFT is the organization that certifies forest bathing guides. Mm -hmm. Um, and Dennis, who asked the original question, said forest therapy is the U.S. version of Japanese forest bathing, and he actually does forest therapy walks. Lovely. So if anyone wants to know more, he left his um, email in the mm -hmm. chat, mm -hmm. which is great. Thanks, Dennis, for doing that. Um, I'm, a, I'm a true believer in exactly that activity. Has it's a very um it's a very powerful it can be a very powerful experience for people so barbara one more question maria asks are you familiar with any research on healing gardens and benefits they provide to hospitals yes the research is clear on that that um the green spaces that hospitals create um provide opportunities for people to have an active role in their own well-being. And it's pretty hard to document healing in any kind of, um, you know, research way, but people's perceptions of their well-being can be documented. And gardens in institutional settings have very positive impacts on people's sense of well-being. I can't speak to the actual healing unless we're talking about healing in the form of improved quality of life and well-being. Thanks, Barbara. Okay, so my shifting of gears is in these last few minutes, I wanna share um, what I'm calling a neighborhood tale. This is a personal story. So Barb and Ted, that's me and my husband. We live in a small half acre lot in Plymouth and the town street has lights, paved road, houses are large and small in terms of their lot sizes. Some are as small as half an acre, some as large as two or three acres. It's a very mixed use kind of neighborhood. It's on a hillside on a north facing slope. When we first moved there in 1984, six, the house was only 800 square feet and we had a dug well and a septic, no outdoor access to the basement. And the lot, the lot, it turns out, was once a dump used by the neighbors to throw their trash away. And it was evac excavated to build the small house in about 1970. It had a very well constructed basement. It had good water drainage because the hillside is very much of a watershed. The yard was all grass with surrounding new growth trees. In other words, uh, the area had been um, completely clear cut, not too long grown. The trees that were growing were pretty much all new growth trees. It was formerly a ski area. Um, the ski area was called Frontenac. And it took about two to three hours every week for us to mow that lawn. Um, and my young family started growing and we needed more space and we couldn't sell the house. It just, it was, it was at a time when the real estate market was in the tank and we tried for about almost two years to sell the house and it just wouldn't sell. So we decided we had to retrofit, retrofit a larger house onto the smaller house. So we did very well with that larger house and continued to mow that lawn religiously throughout the summer. <laughs> And I really started to hate that lawn because it was on a slope and it was hard to mow and it took so much time and energy and gasoline and the, and the lawn was a mess. My neighbors didn't 
like our lawn very much because I didn't do very much to it, nor did I want to. So the year became 2013 and we welcomed some new neighbors down the street who were doing very odd things to their yard. All the odd things were targeting ways of living, such as using less fuel, reducing waste, restoring soil quality and producing food. We, are, we were fascinated by this. And the, the neighbors were completely changing their house and their yard to adopt this sustainable living lifestyle. So Molly McCann, who is my youngest daughter at the time was studying eco-gastronomy at UNH and taking a course in sustainable living and sustainable agriculture. And from both of these sources, we learned about a, um, a sustainable living system called permaculture. And I'm kind of curious, I wish I could have a show of hands of people who may have heard of this system before called permaculture. Three participants are raising their hands. Okay, cool. So what is permaculture? Well, as defined by David Holgram, who is one of the two people um, who coined this term and um, have defined permaculture, is the use of systems thinking and design principles that provide the organizing framework for implementing a permanent or a sustainable culture. So my friends down the street were um, Steve and Charlene Whitman, and Steve was a um, community planner who also discovered permaculture and took it seriously enough to, and the two of them then decided to completely alter their home to fit with permaculture design principles. And these three symb symbols are the ethos of permaculture, which is earth care, people care, and fair share. Hence the title of this presentation, earth care, people care, fair share. And this is a picture of David Holgram standing in front of his home, which is in Victoria, um, in Australia. And it's about three hours northwest of Melbourne. And we actually, I visited this permaculture farm back in uh, 2019, and this was one of the pictures I took. And there's a lot going on in his permaculture site. And he actually gives people tours about twice a year. And we have to be able to secure a seat on that um, tour in the spring of 2019. And permaculture um, principles, there are 12. And not only do they serve as guidelines or principles for sustainable living, and especially in the realm of agriculture, but a lot of people now have taken permaculture principles and applied them to um, principles for life in general, principles for business, principles for relationships. Um, it's been fascinating to watch the morphing of this into more than just how we work with the earth. And I'm going to go through these principles a little more later, so I'm going to move on. Permaculture integrates land, resources, people, and the environment through mutually beneficial, beneficial synergies. And these are other resources that you could look at. Um, the Permaculture Research Institute. Uh, Dave Holgram has published recently published a new book called Retro Suburbia. And there's another really valuable website called Perma What? <laughs> and these two diagrams kind of give a little bit of a artist's rendition of the difference between organic gardening and permaculture design. And so Permaculture is virtually always organic. Organic is not necessarily permaculture. So, and you can see there's kind of looks really different. When you see a permaculture homestead or site, it doesn't look quite like the typical really, really well-groomed yard. But when you really start to understand how the system is working, um, your perceptions of the whole situation really do change. So permaculture can manifest in different ways depending upon perspective and goals. And this diagram is an excerpt from Retro Suburbia by Dave Holgram, the book, where he's diagrammed the different ways that permaculture might manifest on these different continuums from rational to intuitive, 
design or from natural and self-maintaining or intensive and high yielding. And it's interesting because uh, we started this project in our on our property back in um, 2015. So it's been about seven years. Yeah, about seven years. And originally we started off, I wanted to grow food. And so we were looking at more of a intensive high yielding kind of um, idea. And I was thinking I was pretty rational. And so I kind of was up in this upper left quadrant in my design ideas. But as the years have gone by and um, I've decided, well, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit more interested in just general health of my garden and um, pollinators. I wanna support pollinators. I wanna support wildlife. I wanna support this regreening less than I'm worried about producing a lot of food. So I've become more of an intuitive permaculturist and I'm a little bit more interested now in the idea of a forest garden, which is down here around Dave Jackie. And so these are all people who are pretty famous in terms of their permaculture designs and how they um, are working in per the permaculture world. And if you're interested, this is all available in this wonderful book called um, Retro Suburbia. So in 2022 now we have a piece of property which has been radically changed. It has become more fertile. Our plants are flourishing. I have very, very little lawn to take care of. We have abundant birds and wildlife um, that have come to the property. So here's a couple of photographs that show a before and an after of our property. Now, mind you, the before is also in a late winter, early spring setting, but it was actually at the time this photograph was taken, just bare soil. And the soil was very, very sandy. It wasn't very high quality soil. And we ended up doing a tremendous amount of sheet mulching, uh, green manure planting, and just rebuilding this soil from the sand up, so to speak. Okay, this is the diagram of the original permaculture design for our property. And the interesting thing about this was that my daughter Molly, after graduating from UNH and learning about permaculture, she became so inspired that she took a she's actually done two different trainings, one in permaculture design with Steve Whitman, by the way, our neighbor. And she then took a second permaculture instructor training in Costa Rica. And so redesigning our property was one of her first projects. And the I know this is pretty small and difficult to read, but this is the house in the center. And permaculture works on a principle of zones, zone one being very close to the house, zone two being the next layer out, zone three beyond that, and then zone four is, is basically the forest. And so this whole design was how we basically rebuilt our property from the ground up. And uh, it has, we have a whole lot better water management now. We have, um, we produce more food than we can eat. I give away a tremendous amount of food every year and my freezer is full by the end of the season. And we just have what I consider to be a really much improved property from what we originally had. So this on the left is the four of us in the property before the changes. We had just trees kind of out, out here and lots of lawn, not much of a, of a garden. Somebody planted, the previous owners planted a spruce tree right on top of our leach field. So we ended up having to have a whole new septic system put in, which was great because it retrofitted right into the permaculture design process. And these are just some pictures of the first steps that we took in doing sheet mulching, which is laying down cardboard. You can see the cardboard here. And we actually brought in horse manure and cow manure and topped the whole entire thing with wood chips. So this upper right picture is all of the land that used to be lawn is now um, completely converted into growing space, starting with wood chips. We now have fruit trees. We have um, high bush cranberry, apples, pears, peaches, cherries, um, 
elderberries, lots of elderberries that are growing there. And this is our, our winter rendition of same. We built a chicken coop as well. And the chickens are still doing great. The original four chickens that we had who we put to work um, on our annual beds. Uh, we use a lot of their, their chicken manure in our compost and use that in the beds. This is their chicken run where the um, chicken wire is. And next to the chicken run is growing a whole row of comfrey. And the comfrey serves as a green fertilizer. We simply cut it down about three times in the spring, summer, and fall. And we take all the leaves, dry them out, and, and use them in and on the soil as um, compost, basically. And these are This is another picture of some of the sheet mulching that went on around the fruit trees. And there's the chicken coop before and the chicken coop after. This is the chicken run just before we let the chickens into it. Um, we let it grow back full green every year in the fall. We take the chickens out and we put them back in and they pretty much eat it all down to the ground um, while they're laying their eggs. We also were very um, strategic in planting maple trees on the property, which now serve as the boundary line between my neighbor's property. And these are sugar maples by full intention so that in some generation, Henceforth, there will be the opportunity to um, do some tapping if people are interested in that. Oops. And this is Molly doing a little gardening. She does, we do a, a lot of annual um, greens and onions and potatoes and tomatoes and cucumbers and all the various kinds of annual food garden things, as well as. Um, as I said, we do a lot with flowers and with berries. I have a lot of raspberries, blueberries, blackberries, elderberries, black raspberries. So we get quite a berry harvest. And I, it's just been wonderful to see the coming back of the, the pollinators, the birds, the animals. We get butterflies all over the place every summer. And probably I've counted no less than 20 different kinds of bees. I am still looking for more honeybees. The honeybees have had a hard time in Plymouth. Um, this is, if any of you have ever tried planting buckwheat, buckwheat is a marvelous green manure. You grow it, cut it down, dig it in, and the, the ground is so improved, radically improved. This is, this is how the wood chips have held the soil and control the moisture, restore the mycorrhizal life, the fungus life in the soil. And this is using, um, down here on the bottom right is using the comfrey as mulch for, that's actually mulching the garlic I planted at the end of the summer. And these are, this was our harvest of blackberries this year. It was unbelievable how much we got in terms of blackberries. And most of this are, are pretty much our main source of fertilizer is from our compost. We, we compost kitchen scraps and several of our neighbors actually bring their kitchen scraps over um, to add to our compost. So if you haven't started composting, I encourage it highly for um, just a wonderful way to fertilize your garden, big or small. So in conclusion, every effort helps. And I just wanted to review the principles from permaculture briefly. Um, observe and interact, initiate slow, small steps for living, obtain a yield for you or others, apply self-regulation, use and value renewable sources and services, produce no waste, there is no away. So we have really worked very hard to not throw anything away and reduce our use of plastic and try to reuse, repurpose, recycle as much as possible. And then designing from patterns to details, integrating rather than segregating, using slow, small solutions, being patient and persistent, valuing diversity and diverse systems because they're more resilient. You can see this is the backyard. Um, there, we mow the pathways, that's all we mow. Then a lot of times I'll take just a, a sickle or a scythe out there and cut the grass down just so we have walkways. 
use the edges and value the marginal and then creative use creatively use and respond to change. Positive outcomes can come from change. And I've had to learn a lot about change because every year a permaculture garden is slightly different. It's not the same as it was the year before because new plants are coming and old plants are going and um, just the life cycle of things is just so apparent when you take the time to look at it. So these are a couple of different uh, representatives of permaculture designs. So I call this and think of this as re-greening right at home. So we can start with our very own homes to re-green and hopefully the neighborhoods will re-green and hopefully the towns will re-green. And we might actually begin to work from all aspects of that social ecological model. Any last questions? I've used up my time for sure. Wow, thanks, Barbara. That was great. So um, Dennis put in the chat that he's part of the Seacoast Permaculture Group. Yes. And so I was just curious as if you know how many permaculture groups actually exist in New Hampshire and whether or not that's something people can look for. They can look for that. Um, they could probably find it if they use Facebook, they can find some permaculture groups on Facebook. Um, there is a New Hampshire, a lot of this was really getting ahead of steam pre-COVID. And unfortunately COVID has kind of um, brought everything to a screeching halt. Um, but the networks do exist. Dennis is just sharing there are a few permaculture groups in New Hampshire. So I guess we can go looking. And I'll, I'll just mention, so I don't forget, that we can put many of the links that Barbara shared tonight into our follow-up email. So if people would like to, to follow some of those links afterwards, um, they'll be able to do that, just so folks know that. Um, Kathy's wondering where the illustration with hands came from and the names of the garden philosophers. That came from the book Retro Suburbia by David Holgram. And um, I, Retro Suburbia, you can Google that and it'll come right up. He has a quite a robust web page on that. Barbara, I'm, I'm just curious. I've been um, doing phenology, which is following, you know, the life cycles of plants for about 10 years here where I live in Deering. And I'm just curious whether you have done any tracking of the changes in your yard, like systematic kind of tracking, where what was there before you started to do permaculture and how things have evolved since you've been doing it? I have done it, but not as systematically as I probably should have. I'm doing a lot of photography every year. And um, yeah, it. I don't know a lot about that, that process or but I've witnessed it, yes, I, I see. Because as we started with very small plants, we got a lot of our plants from the New Hampshire forest where you can buy plants. We got all our high bush cranberry there. We got, um, and all the fruit trees we got from Fedco. And they just come as these poor little bare root things that are about two feet high. And they just, flourish and have gotten very big and they create their own little ecosystem right where they live and I swear they talk to each other um, so is in terms of the change as I said every year the yard looks different there's a different dominant plant there's a different dominant I, I try not to talk about weeds um, but things sprout differently every year it's, it's just fascinating to watch it Photography is actually a great way to follow phenology. So mm -hmm. if you've been taking photographs all through those years, you actually have a, record, have a visual database. record. Yeah, oh, even if you it? don't have a database. Natural um, resource stewards, great permaculture. Yeah, system. so Maureen sharing, there's a natural resource steward program through the UNH Cooperative Extension. It's a 12 week program with a great permaculture teachings among many other topics. Mm -hmm. I believe Maureen, if I'm correct, and you can 
put this into the chat that the natural resource steward program takes place in the fall. Um, and it's a program that you would sign up for and you have to commit to the 12 weeks. And I believe there's some part of it where you have to share out um, your volunteer expertise after you're done with the program. And this is saying he took the program four years ago. You know, I may not have made the connection overtly, but I have found permaculture to be a mechanism for really changing people's paradigm about nature, especially the nature of their own garden. You know, so much of our gardening that people do is controlling and uses a lot of chemicals and artificial fertilizers and kind of controls everything. But when I discovered permaculture, I sort of realized I don't have to do all that. And it's actually better not to. I can still have this beautiful flourishing forest right in my own backyard. And I guess that's the connection I was trying to make. That's great. So Karen's, Karen's sharing that the hidden life of trees does explain how trees communicate. Highly mm -hmm. recommend the book. Um, and if people want to share anything in the chat, you go to the right hand side, lower right corner, and there are yeah. three dots. And other, you can click on those and share the chat to your computer. The other book that's rocking my world right now is Braiding Sweetgrass. Love that book. Yeah. Yeah. That's another one to highly recommend. Um, I'm just looking, so I was correct, Maureen saying yes, it's in the fall, and I guess this year it starts in early September, there's homework, and they meet every Friday for an entire semester, they visit some farms and forests on field trips. Mm. So that's a great program if people are interested in learning more about natural resources, but also having the opportunity to share with other other folks as well. Um, so I, I just picked up a few things on the Q&A too. Uh, Legs Jackson? Yeah, I shared, I, I actually answered that okay. at the beginning that this program was going to be on our YouTube channel. Cool. So, yeah, so I did share that. and. I'm just kind of curious, are you using the um, buckwheat in your garden in the winter? Or are you actually planting it in the fall? Well, um, I'm still experimenting with a lot of these things. One year I planted winter rye and let it grow to about five inches. And then I actually just took it and flipped the whole sod right over and it made for beautiful soil. The um, buckwheat I'm using on a, on a piece of earth that still really needs a lot of building. And I let it grow until it flowers. And then I just hack it down like with a machete like thing and just leave it. And it's gradually just kind of accumulating in the soil. Once I let it go to seed in the chicken run and the chickens loved the buckwheat seeds. They ate the buckwheat right down to the ground. It was really interesting. Um, buckwheat, you do have to be a little careful because it will go to seed and you will have buckwheat in your garden if you let it go to seed. So using green manure is, is, is a matter of timing. Right. Barbara, this was great. What a nice way to wrap up this series. Really appreciate you being here and sharing all your expertise and, um, and also your what you're doing at your own home, which is really wonderful as an example for all of us. So well, next, next summer, I think I'm gonna open up to a, um, a work away and try to get some young, strong people in to, uh, to educate them about permaculture and get them to help me. <laughs> oh, that sounds like a good idea. Because there's always gonna be a little bit of work to do in a garden unless you just, I guess you could just live in the woods, but we live in the town. So that requires a little maintenance around the property. Yeah, well, that's a great example. And I'm going to let Slater come back up just to give a little bit of a wrap up. 
And um, I just want to uh, thank all of the participants who have come to this presentation. Many have come to all the presentations or many presentations through the year and mm -hmm. share that we are in the process right now of developing a shorter series just on pollinator conservation. So that will happen this spring, summer. And everyone's on our email list. So you will get an announcement or you'll see it on our website or through our e-news. So thank you again. Um, just before we go, Jean is saying, what about signs from the Homegrown National Park Agronomy Program, which is a phenomenal program. Thanks, Jean, for sharing that. Um, and I'm sure, Barbara, that your property would probably qualify for getting on the map for the Homegrown National Park. Um, Who so knew? Thanks, Jean, for for um, putting that in there and reminding us of that great program as well. All right. Well, that was excellent. Uh, thank you everyone for your interest in our Exploring Connection series hosted by New Hampshire Audubon and supported by the New Hampshire Humanities Council. Uh, I'll be sending out a link to an evaluation survey for this webinar in our follow-up email. Um, your feedback is really important to us, uh, and as we continue to host these types of events and talks, it'll be really helpful, uh, you know, in the future. Um, it's also helpful to report back to our funder, so if you could take the time to fill that out for us, we'd be very grateful. Um, this is the final talk in our series, uh, so keep an eye out for our, that next series that Diane mentioned, the pollinator one. Um, and also, if you'd like to watch any of the past talks that were in this series, um, you can go to the Exploring Connections webpage on the Audubon website, uh, find the links there, or just go straight to YouTube and you'll uh, find it on the New Hampshire Audubon YouTube page. Um, so once again, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. McCain um, for uh, presenting this evening, and I'd like to thank Diane for organizing this series. Um, and I'd like to thank you all for tuning in and learning alongside us as well. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again, hopefully in the near future. Uh, and for ways to get involved as a member, a volunteer, or a donor, please visit nhaudubon.org. Thank you again and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thanks, Barbara. Thank you. <laughs> Take care.